Amun. We won't find exciting stories about him in Egyptian myths. He didn't interact with other gods as he remained hidden and unknown to them as well. Unlike other deities, he didn't show anger or weakness, there's nothing human about him. Amun is like the wind that symbolizes him. You can't see it, but you can feel it. Although hidden and unreachable, he was also ubiquitous. In his kindness, he came to help the pharaohs, the poor and needy, and even periodically visited the Theban necropolis to breathe new life into the dead, hidden among the cult statues. The cult of Amun integrated all the other Egyptian traditions, creating a new religious system. The search for his mysterious, transcendental nature resulted in the creation of one of the most sophisticated theologies of antiquity. The story of Amun-Ra is the story of Egypt, especially the New Kingdom. Today we'll try to find the one who is hidden. Hello everyone, my name's Irena. Welcome to my channel Ancient Side Girl. I invite you to a podcast about the history of ancient Egypt. Today we'll learn lesser known facts about Amun. Amun, Amon, Amen, Amana are one and the same God. The ancient Egyptians didn't write down vowels in both hieroglyphics and hieratic writing, believing that there was no need for this because the recipient would easily guess what the word was and insert the missing vowels himself. Amun's most common image is difficult to confuse with any other deity. Although invisible, he was presented in anthropomorphic form in clothes and poses typical of pharaohs. His trademark is a crown topped with feathers, shuti. These aren't ostrich feathers, curved at the end, as in Atef, the crown of Osiris, or Maat's feather, but straight feathers, probably of a falcon. The shuti feather wears another Theban god, Monto. However, a moon most resembles the god of fertility, Min. During the Ramasid period, images of Amun-Ra with dark blue skin dominate, emphasizing his connection with the primordial waters of Nun, which, like Amun himself, precede the great creation, sometimes symbolized as a primeval goose or serpent. In his main sanctuary in Karnak, we'll find his ram-headed representations, and in this form he was widely worshipped in Nubia. Who was he, and how did it happen that the god about whom the ancients wrote that nothing certain is testified about him became the king of the Egyptian pantheon? The exclusivity and elitism of the Old Kingdom solar religion made it impossible for ordinary Egyptians to actively participate in the cult, personal contact with God was unattainable. As the religion of Osiris developed in the Middle Kingdom, they were able to connect with the God of the Dead after death, as only the pharaohs once could. However, the Supreme Sun God was inaccessible to them. When with the beginning of the New Kingdom, the Tutmosids presented the Egyptians with the guardian deity of their dynasty, Amun, as Amun-Ra, the king of the gods, everything changed. The invisible one but the omnipresent Amun couldn't remain only in the temple. This new solar cult took on the character of a universal religious movement in the New Kingdom. 
The worshippers of Amun-Ra experienced the god directly, and the idea of personal piety was supported by the clergy, especially in the Ramasid times, as a reaction to the heresy of Akhenaten, whose new own religion of the only one god, the sun god Aten, was reserved exclusively for himself and his inner circle. Thus, former religious traditions were restored to Egypt along with countless deities, who now became an aspect of the all-encompassing, all-comprehensive Amun-Ra. Listening, obedience and judging are modes of justice that were associated with the Sun God. A completely new concept, presented in the hymns of the early 18th dynasty, presents the relationship between pious believers and God's warmth, kindness and personal parental attention that Amun-Ra devotes to people. He provides them with a satisfying life, as, quote, a good ruder that does not break, that enlightens both countries, whenever you see him, good things happen. Instead of the strict judge Ra, Amun-Ra is presented as an ethical authority. The concept of a universal, supreme god accompanied the Egyptians from the beginning. Horus appears to have fulfilled this role in pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egypt. In the beginning of the Old Kingdom, the new solar religion of the god Ra dominated Egypt, and the builders of the great pyramids, the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty, sat on the throne as sons of the sun, living gods. As Atum Ra, the sun god was considered the sole creator, and during the fifth dynasty he overtook all other gods, including Horus, the god of kingship. At that time, instead of great pyramids, the rulers built temples of the sun. The influence of the Heliopolitan priests was constantly growing, and their theology shaped the Egyptians, mainly their view on the act of creation and the first time, Zeb Tepi. Then the first land, a mound, Benben, was to emerge from the primeval cosmic ocean of Nun, on which the spontaneously created a tomb stood, the first of the gods who immediately began the act of creation, starting from the first divine pair of Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, from which the deities of earth and heaven, Geb and Nut, were then born. Their children, Osiris, Set, Isis and Nephthys, are the last generation of the divine Inuit a group of the first nine gods who witnessed the creation of the universe. According to influential Memphite theologians, Memphis was the capital of Egypt from the beginning of the Old Kingdom, the Inuit was preceded by the god Ptah, identified with the Benben Mount itself, worshipped in Memphis as Tatanen, the personification of Benben. The theologists of Hermopolis went even further, focusing on the time before the creation of the world and on the primordial cosmic vastness, which the Egyptians imagined as an all-embracing and motionless dark ocean. In the minds of the Egyptians it symbolized chaos, the world of people and the entire creation were protected from the flooding of the waters of Nun by gods, such as the goddess of the sky Nut, who separated the earth from Nun with her celestial body, supported by Shu, the god of atmosphere and air. This seemingly barren ocean, however, had creative potential, since a tomb the creator of the universe himself emerged from it. According to Hermopolitan myth, Nun had inherent qualities, represented by eight primordial deities called Ogdoad. 
They were aspects of Nun, generally depicted in iconography as aquatic creatures of both sexes, male deities as frogs and female deities as snakes. Next to Nun was his female counterpart, Nunet. They symbolized the stagnant primeval water itself, Hehu and Hehet, its unlimited reach, Kek and Kauket, darkness, and finally Amun and Amunet personified the invisibility, hidden and unknowable nature of Nun. The female and male aspects of chaos eventually converged, which led to the release of creative energy, resulting in the pyramidal mount of Benben, the first land from which the sun rose, Atum Ra, and the act of creation could finally take place. Thus, Amun as one of the pre-gods of Ogduat existed before the act of creation and personified the waters of chaos. The post-Amun iconography of Amun referred to this genesis as he was shown with blue skin, which symbolized water among the Egyptians. This is how they presented Nun himself, but also, among others, the goddess Nut, as they believed that her heavenly form was a body of water, above our heads on which the solar bark of the god Ra and other gods sailed. In the most famous preserved texts of the Old Kingdom, also the oldest religious texts known to us, the extensive pyramid texts of the 5th and 6th dynasties, the name Amun was written only three times. For comparison, the name of Osiris is mentioned about 500 times, and the name of Horus even more often. So, Amun was definitely not one of the most popular deities at the end of the Old Kingdom. He was mentioned in the context of Ogdoat together with his female counterpart. In the pyramid of Pharaoh Unas from the 24th century BC, we read You have your bread loaf, Nu and Undersky, you pair of the gods who joined the gods with their shadow. You have your bread loaf, Amun and Amunet, you pair of the gods who joined the gods with their shadow. We know that already in the Old Kingdom the invisible and hidden mysterious god was called Great, which refers to national deities that were widely known and worshipped. Perhaps his cult was of a secret, esoteric nature, intended for initiated high priests and rulers? An intriguing thought. Moreover, archaeologists discovered a local cult of Amun in Thebes, dating back to the Old Kingdom. We know that Thebes would become his great capital and his Theban sanctuary in Karnak, the largest religious complex in the ancient world. It seems, however, that Amun was imported to Thebes from Hermopolis, where he was known as the Ogdoad deity much earlier. According to the Theban creation myth, the role of Amun wasn't limited only to being an aspect of Nun, but he was the only entity who preceded the waters of Nun. He was the hidden force behind the act of creation. He was the source of all creation. The oldest Theban versions of the myth present the act of creation as the piercing call of a goose that disturbed the stillness of the waters of Nun and triggered the irreversible process of creation. Both the Ogdoat deities and Inuit's creative gods were merely aspects of Amun, whose face and name remained hidden, even to the gods. He was the power behind all creation, but he wasn't a part of it, like the cosmic waters of Nun themselves. He stayed hidden, and the goose remained its animal symbol. In 
in the synthesis of various Egyptian creation myths, the role of Amun-Ra is crucial in all phases of Genesis. In the late period and in Greco-Roman times, the serpent Kematev, or Amun Kematev, appears, dwelling alone in the dark, primeval waters of Nun. His name, or rather epithet, means he whose moment is complete, or he who is no longer existent. Kematev performs the first act of creation. These are his children. The cosmic eternal serpent Amun Irita and the Ophidian form of the goddess Mut, the divine wife of Amun, who at the threshold of the new kingdom replaced his traditional consort Amunet. Of the pair of snakes born from Kematev, Irita becomes the creator of the universe. He emerged from the waters of Nun to shape the cosmos and form the first dry land. Amun Irita was worshipped in Ptolemic times at Karnak as the vital, youthful aspect of Amun. His oldest incarnation, Kematev Serpent, had its chapel in Medinet Habu, in western Thebes. According to one of the Theban traditions, two snakes, Amun Irita and his companion, Amunet or Mut, formed the first egg in Hermopolis, from which Amun Ra hatched, the third generation of the same god. After that, the siblings returned to Thebes to live forever at their father's side, in the underground caves over which the Habu temple now stands. The small, inconspicuous temple of Amun in Medinet Habu was built by Hatshepsut and Thutmos III, where the god was worshipped in the form of Kematev. On its walls we read, Amun Ra of Medinet Habu, Nun the Elder, who came about in the beginning. Today the temple is located in the shadow of the huge mortuary temple of Ramesses III, who incorporated it into the walls of his own sanctuary. Of course, when discovering the investigations of Theban theologians about the creation of the world and the nature of the original incarnations of the moon, we are limited mainly to Greek translations and their philosophical interpretations. These myths certainly have their earlier versions, but information about Kematev and Irit is to be found only in Ptolemaic and Roman texts. The Greek historian from the 2nd century AD, Plutarch, noted that Thebes was a unique city among the Egyptians because mortal gods were not worshipped here. As he wrote, The inhabitants of the Thebaid alone do not bury sacred animals, since they believe in no mortal god but only in him whom they call Knef who is unbegotten and immortal. Knef is, of course, the snake Kematev. According to Plutarch, the supreme deity of Thebes, the primordial god who arose from himself and never died. He also claimed that Theban priests set aside the idol worship so common in Egypt and believed in a transcendent deity. The Phoenician philosopher of the 3rd century AD, Prophyri, writes, The Demiurge, whom the Egyptians called Knef, is of human form, but with a skin of dark blue, holding life and a scepter, bearing a royal feather on his head, because reason is hard to find and hidden and not conspicuous, and because it is life-giving, and because it is king, and because it moves in an intellectual way. That is why the feather has been put upon his head. 
They say that this God put forth from his mouth an egg, from which was born a God whom they themselves called Ptah, but the Greek Hephaestus, and the egg they interpreted as the world. Theban spirituality of the Greco-Roman period is described by the expert himself, the Theban priest Abamon, in his correspondence with the Syrian philosopher Iamblichus. Quote, For the demiurgic intellect, who is master of truth and wisdom, when he comes to create and brings into the light the invisible power of the hidden Logoi, is called a moon in the Egyptian tongue. When he infallibly and expertly brings to perfection each thing in accordance with truth, he is termed Ptah. When he is productive of goods, he is called Osiris, and he acquires other epithets in accordance with other powers and activities. Although ordinary Romans were fascinated by stories about Isis, Osiris, Anubis and mysterious ceremonies honoring the gods of the dead, philosophers were interested in issues related to a moon and his role in the creation of the universe. But let's go back to Pharaonic Egypt. As a result of political and economic crises, probably caused by rapid climate changes, the Old Kingdom collapses, and Egypt of the First Intermediate Period is divided into many small, conflicting states. After a hundred years of chaos, Egypt was united by the great ruler of Thebes, Mentuhotep II, around 1980 BC. The 11th dynasty omitted Amun in its royal titles, and at that time the main guardian god of Thebes was the warrior falcon-headed Montu. The cult of the prehistoric fertility god Min was also popular. The features of both these gods would be adapted later by Amun himself. The flourishing of the cult of Amun in Thebes began during the 12th dynasty of the Middle Kingdom, the state of the Amenemhats and Sisostris, who moved their capitals to the north to, like the ancient kings, sons of the sun, build pyramids in Lisht, Dachshur or Hawara, where they also took the cult of Amun. The name of the four pharaohs of the 12th dynasty Amenemhat means a moon is at the head. Then their patron became the Egyptian national deity. As for the royal names, we find a moon mainly in the New Kingdom, when his cult reached its apogee, especially among the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty. The four of them were named Amenhotep, which means a moon is pleased, and Tutankhamun can be translated to living image of a moon. A perfect example of all aforementioned features of a moon are included in a hymn from the tomb of the 18th dynasty Theban noble Jehuti, who was Hatshepsut's high official. This tomb is particularly close to me, because after many years of archaeological works, it was opened to the public for the first time at the beginning of this year. Luckily, I was one of the first visitors to TT11. Jehuti wrote, Hail to you, a moon Ra, the primeval time of the earth from the beginning, the great god compared to the Inuit who came forth from the primeval waters, who illuminates the two lands when he rises. Hail to you, Amun Ra, Lord of Heaven, powerful, when he is observed, something good happens. May you set me on the path of the Lord of Eternity, as I shall not deviate from your guidance. 
Jehuti's pharaoh, Hatshepsut, seemed to have a more practical approach. She knew how to use Amun's authority to achieve her political goals. Hatshepsut was the daughter of King Thutmose the I and the great royal wife Ahmos or Ahmes. After the death of the pharaoh, his son from a less important wife, Thutmose the Second, who married his half sister Hatshepsut, succeeded to the throne. However, he reigned for a short time, and Hatshepsut ruled as regent on behalf of his several-year-old child. Thutmose III. Thutmose III wasn't her child, but the child of Thutmose's second wife, named Iset. In the seventh year of her regency, Hatshepsut unexpectedly declared herself pharaoh, so Egypt had two co-ruling kings, Thutmose III and Hatshepsut, with the actual power resting with her. To strengthen her rights to the throne, the usurper Hatshepsut ordered the myth of her miraculous divine birth to be presented in her temple in Der el-Bahri. On the so-called portico of the divine birth, we learn of Amun's decision to beget a great queen, which he announces to the gods. She builds your chapels, said Amun to the Inyet. She consecrates your temples. She makes you rich offerings. The dew of heaven shall fall in her time, and the Nile shall be high in her time. Surround her with your protection, with life, happiness, unto eternity. The Inuit answered, We have come herewith. We surround her with our protection, with life and happiness. Amun orders Toth, the god of wisdom, to find the queen he has chosen to be the future mother of his daughter. Tot tells Amun, This young woman is a princess. She is called Yahmas. She is more beautiful than all the women in the whole land. She is the wife of the king, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. And his majesty is still a youth. Go therefore to her. In the described myth, Hatshepsut doesn't completely deprive her father Tutmose I of merits. After all, the hidden god visits her mother in the form of Thutmose. Quote, there came the ruling god Amun, lord of the throne of the two lands. After he had assumed the form of the majesty of her husband, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Thutmose I. He found her as she rested in the innermost area of her palace. Then she awoke because of the scent of the god, and she smiled at his majesty. At the same time, he went there to her and was full of desire for her. He gave her his heart and allowed her to recognize him in his divine form, after which he approached her. She rejoiced to show her beauty and his love went over into her body. The palace was flooded with the fragrance of the god. All his scent was the fragrance from Punt. As we know, the Egyptians imported incense and aromatic resins from the mysterious overseas land of Punt. We read further in the myth. The royal wife and king's mother, Ahmes, spoke to the majesty of the splendid god Amun, to the lord of the throne of the two lands. My lord, how great is your glory, how splendid it is to see your face. You have enclosed my majesty with your glance. Your fragrance is in all my parts. After the majesty of this god had done with her all which he wished, then Amun, the lord of the throne of the two lands, spoke to her. Hatshepsut is thus the name of this your daughter, whom I have laid in your body, according to the speech of your mouth. She will exercise splendid kingship in the whole land. 
my glory will belong to her, my authority will belong to her, and my crown will belong to her. She will rule the two lands. Thereupon Amun commissioned Knum to execute Ka of Hatshepsut. Knum formed the bodies of children on his potter's wheel and then inserted them in the bodies of their mothers. Of course, Hatshepsut was later delivered by Isis and Nephthys. When the goddess Hathor brought their child to Amun, he shouted, Hail, my daughter, from my body, Mat Ka Ra, my beautiful image, firstborn daughter. You are the king, the king who rules both countries on the throne of Horus, like Ra. Then he kissed her, embraced her, and loved her most of all. Soon, however, the rapidly growing cult of Amunura was attacked from the least expected side by the pharaoh himself, a member of the dynasty that exalted Amunura above all other gods, the son and successor of the great Amenhotep III, Amenhotep IV, probably in the fifth year of his reign, unexpectedly changed his name to Akhenaten. He no longer wanted to be associated with the god Amun and called himself Servant of Aten, the impersonal sun god symbolized by the solar disk. The pharaoh proclaimed him the only god outlawed all other cults and dissolved the priesthood. The new religion was to refer to the ancient times of Egypt, the rule of the living gods, the sons of the sun. However, Akhenaten's religious, social and political revolution almost led to the collapse of the state. Initially, the eager pharaoh focused on developing his new monotheistic religion and building its center, the capital, in Amarna. Over time, the rule of the isolated king became less productive and Akhenaten focused more and more on self-aggrandizement. The life and salvation of the Egyptians depended solely on his will, a model of a specific triad the ruler, his wife Nefertiti, and the sun god were to replace the ancient gods. Fear and obedience replaced values and age-old traditions. From the beginning of this revolution, he destroyed and plundered Egyptian temples, and the main target of his attacks was the powerful cult of Amun. The names of the hidden god were effaced wherever they were found, from statues, walls, obelisks and even small statuettes like scarabs. All the vast wealth of the temples of Amun was transported to the great sun temple at Akhenaten, in today's Amarna. The Theban temples, although demolished and deserted, survived thanks to Akhenaten's move from Thebes, but we don't know the true scale of the destruction. These temples were restored in later years, and most of those that survive today were built after Akhenaten's death. The heretic pharaoh died around 1334 BC, leaving Egypt in chaos. After the short reign of his son Smenkhkara and queen Neferneferaten, the last of Thutmosids, Tutankhaten ascended the throne and in the third year of his reign changed his name to Tutankhamun, the living image of Amun. The king returned to Thebes and restored the cult of Amun. The 
the obvious failure of Akhenaten's reforms wasn't resolved quickly. The final break with heresy and its condemnation took place only after the death of Tutankhamun and his successor Ai. It was then that an army general from outside the royal family, Horemheb, came to the throne. He owed the crown only to, quote, the choice and grace of Amun Ra. He introduced a decree fully restoring the old order from before the times of Akhenaten. All traces of the cult of Aten were erased, and the driving force behind the reconstruction of Egypt's position from 30 years ago and the return to tradition was the proven national cult of Amun Ra. The gigantic construction projects of the new Ramasid dynasty at Karnak and throughout Egypt immortalized the name of Amun. The magnificent temples of Seti I and Ramesses the Great have survived to this day as symbols of ancient Egypt. The rulers of the 19th dynasty governed from the north, from Memphis and P. Ramesses Meri Amun, which means House of Ramesses, the Beloved of Amun. So the clergy of Karnak were kept at a distance and the priests regained their former power only at the decline of the new kingdom. The cult of Amun flourished solely by the will of the pharaohs and expanded, just like the Egyptian empire, from Syria to Nubia. Although Amun was the supreme god in Tutmosid times, he wasn't considered helpful on the battlefield. During numerous military campaigns, people turned to the warrior god of Thebes, Montu. This changed in Ramasid Egypt. Restoring Amun's authority required attributing all merits to him. On the walls of the temple of Abu Simbel, Ramasis the Great describes their victory over the Hittites in the famous Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC. There was no officer with me, no charioteer, no soldier and no shield-bearer. My infantry and my chariotry had fled before the enemy and not one soldier stood firm to fight with me. Desperate I prayed aloud, O oh, my father Amun, what is happening? Is it right that a father should turn his back on his son? Are you determined to ignore my plight? Do I not obey your every command? I have followed every order that you've given me. Amun, Lord of Egypt, is surely too great to allow foreigners to impede his way. What do these wretched, godless Asiatics mean to you, Amun? I have built you many monuments and filled your temples with war booty. I dedicated my mortuary temple to you and endowed it with all my wealth. I gave you the lands that you needed to support your altars. I sacrificed 10,000 cattle and burned many kinds of sweet herbs before you. I built magnificent gateways to you and erected their flagpoles myself. I brought you seaworthy ships and obelisks from Yebu. Will people now say there's little to be gained by trusting a moon? I'm counting on you. Do the right thing by me, and I will serve you with a loving heart. I call upon you, my father, Amun. Yes, I know that Amun will help me more than a million troops, more than a hundred thousand charioteers, more than ten thousand brothers and sons. The deeds of mortals are as nothing. Amun is far greater help than they could ever be. The great god replies, Go forward, for I am with you. Your father is with you and is guiding your hand. I will triumph over a hundred thousand men, for I am the lord of victory, and I will reward your valor.
the utter walls of Ramesses' temple throughout Egypt were decorated with scenes of victory and images of a moon encouraging the king to fight. Ordinary Egyptians could see these two together in person once a year. For this purpose, they set out for the holy city of Amun, Thebes, where in the second month of Akhet, the Nile inundation, the greatest festival in honor of Amun, the famous Opet festival, took place. It was the most important religious event of the year. Crowds of thousands watched the gods' parade led by the pharaoh, the highest dignitaries, priests and the army parade. God reached out to the people so that they could fully participate in his cult and to witness the renewal of Pharaoh's union with God. The golden statue of Amun was placed in the most famous ceremonial bark in Egypt, Usar Hetamun. It was built already under the first pharaoh of the new kingdom, Ahmos I, but we actually can't say that it was just one bark, because it was rebuilt and decorated anew every year. Built of cedar wood, Amun's bark was covered entirely in gold and jewels. A pair of ceremonial oars was attached at the stern, and symbols of the ram-headed god Amun-Ra decorated both ends of the boat. It was over four meters long, two meters wide, and three meters high. It was carried by as many as thirty priests. It set out from the Holy of Holies on the two-mile journey to the Luxor Temple along the Avenue of Sphinxes. It often returned to Karnak by the Nile, loaded onto a river barge. The festival probably brought considerable profits to Karnak. The more influence the clergy gained in the country, the longer the Opet festival was celebrated. But perhaps it was only a demonstration of the power of the cult. In the times of the 18th dynasty, the festival lasted 11 days, and in the times of the 20th dynasty, 27 days. Thanks to written sources from the time of Ramesses III in the 12th century BC, we know that the cult of Amun was served by over 80,000 people at one time, including apart from priests, workers, farmers, administrators and boatmen. The 65 Egyptian cities dedicated to Amun maintained his vast sanctuaries. After the death of the last great pharaoh of the new kingdom, Ramesses III, there was a gradual decline of the ruler's authority. In the weakened state of the 20th dynasty, the priests of Amun take the political initiative. After the fall of the dynasty, the country was divided. In the north, the delta governors of Tanis establish their own dynasty, while in the south, there is no dynasty. The beginning of the third intermediate period in the 11th century BC was the rule of Amun in Thebes, a true theocracy and the apogee of his cult. In practice, the highest priests of Karnak, starting with Herihor, exercised a military dictatorship over Upper Egypt. We learn about the ideas of God's uniqueness and excellence in the hymns to Amun, which somehow ignore the role of other gods in creation myths. The only one, Amun-Ra, is the one who created all that exists. The alone one who created what is, from whose eyes people came and from whose words gods came into being. 
creator of the herbs that feed cattle, creator of wood for humanity and the birds that inhabit the sky. He who gives air to everyone in the egg, who keeps the young snakes alive, who creates what the worms feed on, who takes care of the mice in their holes. The father of the fathers of all gods, who raised the heavens and the earth, who created beings and gave birth to what is, the leader of the gods. Amun's cult was constantly evolving, enriched with local traditions and separate theological schools. Hundreds of hymns have survived to this day in Egyptian tombs and on the walls of temples, from the mighty Karnak to small, isolated temples such as the Temple of Hebes from the late period. A moon known to us from Karnak with his traditional epithets, Lord of the Tulans or King of the Gods, is an archetypal royal deity. Elsewhere he was worshipped mainly as a primeval creator god, for example in Medinet Habu, but also in sanctuaries distant from Thebes. Herodotus mentions the local cult of Amun at El Karga oasis, located in the western desert. Quote, the first oasis on the journey from Thebes, ten days distant from there, are the Ammonians, who follow the worship of the Zeus of Thebes, for, as I have said before, the image of Zeus at Thebes has the head of a ram. Hymns to the ram-headed Amun of Hebes were written during the Persian rule over Egypt. Quote, it is in allowing throats to breathe that he spits out wind, in his name of Amun who endures in all things, the Ba of Shu for every god, Horus of the five Ba's, a living one who lives in Nun, in his name of living royal Ka. God of the Sun Folk. O oh, may we give acclamation unto him, whom happy brings from his grotto, who makes verdant the wood of life, who cares for that which comes out of him, in his name of Nun the Elder, Amun Ra of Medinet Habu, Nun the Elder who came about in the beginning, Bull who ejaculates Nun. Of course, the most famous oasis of Amun of those times was the legendary Shiva. Alexander the Great, after a victorious campaign in Palestine, entered Egypt at the end of 332 BC. The degraded country occupied by Persians on and off for over 100 years welcomed the Macedonian king as a liberator. After paying homage to the Memphis gods, Alexander set off to one of the most famous oracles, located deep in the Libyan desert, in the Shiwa oasis. The oracle of Amun Ra in Shiwa was a sanctuary isolated from the rest of Egypt on the western frontier. The temple built during the 26th dynasty in the 6th century BC was a gift from the pharaohs to the Libyan tribes. Over time, news about this magical place spread among the Greeks, who identified Amun with Zeus. They believed that the temple was built by Dionysus himself during his wanderings in distant lands. It was to be visited by, among others, Heracles and Perseus. During the long journey of Alexander and his army to the oracle, of Amun Zeus, miracles were said to happen. Heavy rains in the middle of the desert, snakes and ravens showing him the way. The sanctuary had been famous for its miracles since 200 years earlier. A 50,000 strong Persian army moving towards Shiva was allegedly swallowed by the desert.
Plutarch claimed that Alexander was proclaimed on the spot by the priests as the son of a moon Zeus. They also recognized his right to rule over the entire world. From then on, Alexander, crowned pharaoh in Memphis, could be shown on coins with ram's horns on his head, the symbol of a moon Zeus. In the following centuries, the famous oracle was visited by, among others, Hannibal, Cato the Younger, and Strabo. Unlike the Greeks, the Romans didn't make pilgrimages to the oracle in large numbers. So, Shiva fell into decline, the isolated oasis resisted Christianity, and its inhabitants abandoned Amun in favor of Islam only in the 12th century. It was probably the last place of worship of the hidden god. Only a small fragment of the walls remains of Amun's temple, but their site is still controversial. According to some, it was here that the remains of Alexander the Great were finally transferred from his mausoleum in Alexandria. Amun's rule over lands outside Egypt was clear to the Egyptians already in the times of the 20th dynasty. In the hymn from Deir al Medina, we read Greetings, Amun Ra, Lord of Thebes, first of Karnak, who presides over his kingdoms, first of Upper Egypt, ruler Medje, ruler of Punt. Medje refers to the Nubian nomads from the land of Medja which was located east of the Second Cataract. Medje are known mainly for performing guard and police functions in New Kingdom Egypt. They protected the borders, royal cemeteries and palaces. And over time, the term Medje became simply synonymous with the police, and their elite ranks also included ethnic Egyptians. While Amun's position as a national deity gradually declined in the late period in favor of the renaissance of the cult of Osiris and then the expansive religion of Isis, Amun-Ra continued to reign supreme in Iron Age Nubia. The cult of Amun fell on fertile ground in Nubia. It seems to have survived there the longest as the dominant religion. Amun appears in Nubia during the New Kingdom and although theories about his Nubian roots have recently become popular, the facts seem to contradict this. Amun already appears in the pyramid texts, as does the concept of a hidden great god. Even though Nubia was firmly in the Egyptian sphere of influence, already in the Middle Kingdom, the Nubians disregarded its cult until the New Kingdom. Also, the word Aman in the Nubian language describing water isn't proof of the Nubian origin of the god, because the entire language is much younger than the Egyptian name Amun. The largest center of the cult of Amun in Upper Nubia was Napata, the capital of the Kingdom of Kush, currently northern Sudan. It was believed that this was the birthplace of the god, specifically the Jebel Barkal, towering over the city, called the Throne of the Two Lands by the Nubians. Interestingly, in the first temples built by the Egyptians in Nubia during the Egyptian 18th dynasty, images of the god were often signed as Lord of the Two Thrones and Lord of Karnak. As we can see, the Nubians interpreted these enigmatic epithets in their own way and called sacred Jebel Barkal in Napata Karnak of Amun. I hope you learned something new about the beliefs of ancient Egyptians today. Thank you for listening. Please let me know in the comments what you would like to hear about next time. Don't forget to like my video 
and subscribe to my channel. Goodbye and see you on the next one.